It is a pleasure to have her here. Let's give a warm DPC welcome to Dr. Hannah Valentine.
but I particularly want to emphasize the first five of those, the commitment to create and enhance diversity and inclusion at all levels, the uh, evidence for creating and enhancing uh, inclusive environments, particularly culturally appropriate, uh, demonstrating institutional commitment for creating and maintaining diversity, particularly at the faculty level. So hold that thought. And sustainability and institutional support. Those are the goals. You can regard this as hallmarks of success with the goals uh, of all of this in faculty development. And this last one, very important, inter-institutional collaborations. I really think that that's the way to go in the future. So those are the kinds of learnings that have really shaped the direction in which I'm thinking about for uh, a national effort in scientific workforce and diversity. So let me just share with you some of the recent data that I've been looking at, and I presented this at the advisory committee to the director in June. And um, there are four key data points. One is the gaps in funding for research grants, R01 or R01 equivalents. The, secondly, were the existing gaps for career development awards pre-doctoral and post-doctoral fellowships, and then in an area which really is, uh, NIH does not have much uh, to do in controlling the numbers, perhaps a bit, but not much, the attainment of PhD in life sciences, chemistry, and math. And if you look at the data, what we see is that we've had increase in the numbers of uh, investigators from underrepresented groups, that is to say, African American, Hispanic, Native American, Pacific Islander, we've seen an uptick in the number of applications, an uptick in the number of awardees and the award rate, and a slight narrowing of the African American likelihood of funding the R01, but that gap still exists. When we look at mentored career development awards, what we are seeing is that again there are increases for URGs and applicants and awardee rates and a significant narrowing of the African American white gap. Similar data for postdoctoral fellowships and um, the PhD attainment. So let's just look at that very quickly. This is the R01 or R01 equivalents and the funding rates for looking at both the combined type 1 and the type 2 which is the uh, first uh, grants and the, uh, uh, and the renewals by race and ethnicity. And just to draw your attention, this is the number of applicants, and here it's broken down by uh, race, ethnicity. And what you can see here is, first of all, the very minuscule numbers uh, of applicants who are from African American or a Hispanic uh, background. So that's the big problem, which we all hope that we'll be able to change with the DPC. Um, however, when you compare um, 2018 to 2013, we do see a uh, small but significant increase, nearly 30% of applicants' applications coming from African-American investigators. And if, on this side, what you're seeing is that are the funding rates comparing 2013, remember, just before DPC was launched, to 2018. And I draw your attention to the group, which is African American, that really was the trigger for all of this new and added work through the Gintha report. So whereas in 2013, 12.2% funding rate, it's now 20 Six. Mind you, everybody has gone up, but the rate of increase of nearly 70% for African American is higher. And when you have such tiny numbers, it's actually important to look at the number of grants that we are talking about. And here it is. In 2013, 
52 R01 type grants were awarded to African American scientists. In 2018, it's um, 113, which is an increase um, in percentage of about uh, just over 100 percent. Again, I would not break open the champagne for this. I would wait until these numbers get really a lot higher for uh, that celebration. But suffice it to say, also, the same um, kind of data uh, is existing for Hispanic Latino with this increase from 183 to 390. Now, when we look at the mentored career development, as you all know, these are the K awards. They are the, um, the stage, just the penultimate stage before career independence. There we see uh, an increase uh, that is really uh, very exciting. So in 2013, 22 of applications were funded from African American um, investigators applying for a K award. And now, um, and that compared to 34% for uh, whites. And now we see that for African American in 2018, the award rate is 34% uh, compared to 37%. That difference is not such a significant. So this gives me great excitement, and I'm putting it down purely to the work in, um, in the grant writing programs in uh, NRMN. <laughs> and others. <laughs> uh, you might all be aware of the Vero Award in Nigeria, and I was looking at that later to, to the, yesterday, and it's quite exciting to see the number of African American as being supported by that. And um, when you uh, look at um, the number of awards, again, again very important to look um, at these. These are small numbers, yes, yeah, so big deal, it went from 26 to 63. We need to see those a lot higher. Um, and similarly for Hispanic Latino uh, scientists. Now when we look at the PhD recipients uh, pools, because that's the pipeline or pathway that will be feeding all this, it's important to ask the question, how are we doing there on, based on national statistics? And thankfully the, um, the doctoral um, um, NSF um, doctoral recipients, they publish this uh, survey on a regular basis. And if you look at uh, the fields broken down by biomedical sciences, chemistry, health science, etc., psychology, all of the ones that are relevant to NIH uh, research, you see that the numbers uh, continue to increase uh, significantly. And uh, that's uh, quite reassuring uh, for us all. Here is some of the NRMN grant and coaching uh, results. Again, I think this is a publication being uh, in preparation to be published and I just draw your attention to these 89 NIH awards. This is in a very short period of time for this to have occurred. 71% um, of those uh, can participate uh, of these awards going to URG uh, investigators, 73% women and, um, and a significant uh, realization of uh, the dollars that this has resulted in. Um, so this, this is very exciting uh, work. So let me then move, um, talk about the institution and the systems-wide approaches based on what I have seen happening and learned through the DPC. As I mentioned, um, a lot of our previous work has focused on the individual but that although much necessary and much important to continue, we need to be thinking about how we create these institutional systems um, for change. As, an, as a model, um, we need to have uh, programs um, or systems that promote transparency and accountability with systematic uh, review and transparency of hiring and promotion policies of institutions transparency in collecting the data 
and not having it just sit on a shelf but publishing it so that uh, departments can see their own and uh, trigger their natural competition and maybe even provide some incentivizing uh, for that. Provide tools. Um, it's all well and good for diversity, inclusion professionals like myself to wag the finger and say we must do better. We must, we know that this takes work and we need to develop tools for people to use. And then of course evaluation a key element of the DPC is critical and to the extent that institutions adopt this evaluation of where they're going in terms of institutional culture and climate is critically important. But I would say that one of the most important things that none of us do very well is to link all of this to our institutional reward systems. And notice I say reward, not award. Many of us in this field probably have, you know, wallfuls of uh, plaques. Um, this is talking about rewards, uh, not awards. So now let's talk about applying these lessons. The first lesson is the work that uh, done by our colleague Ken Gibbs, who's right here, who's worked diligently within the DPC itself. And I think this particular information has really changed the dialogue in this space. And this is all known to you, Kenny demonstrated very nicely that while we have uh, women, the numbers of women increasing steadily, their hiring into assistant professor positions has not kept pace. This is in marked contrast to what we see with men. But even more dramatically in this data set was the demonstration that the increase in the number of PhDs uh, receiving um, uh, PhDs in NIH relevant fields who are themselves from underrepresented groups, uh, it also has not kept pace with their hiring in um, as assistant professors. And this, I think, alone was what was very important to change the NIH leadership thinking about the need to invest more into faculty diversity, and I'll get back to that in a moment. And so, uh, let me just point out for you some of the factors, and I, I, I think all of you are very attuned to what these are, some of the social cultural barriers that um, faculty and students from underrepresented groups often face, this feeling of isolation, uh, lack of sense of belonging, this minority tax, whereby we all um, go have to do so many service activities. I myself fell into that trap when I was first appointed as Senior Associate Dean for Diversity and Leadership at Stanford. The first thing I said was that we would have a mandate that at every search committee there would be a faculty member from an underrepresented group until I realized that all 25 of us at the time would be constantly on, <laughs> um, on those uh, search committees, so I quickly changed that criteria. Um, you know, the uh, students and um, faculty face various forms of harassment, and then they internalize some of these feelings and worry about succumbing to a negative stereotype associated with their identity group. They become hypervigilant of errors and failures and they're there in their spotlight and uh, really fall, fall, uh, fall prey to stereotype threat and imposter syndrome. And implicit bias is a major contributing factor. And whether or not implicit or explicit, and I would say implicit and explicit, the phenomena of bias is per pervasive. And what this is, is just showing your collage of whatever industry, whatever space you look at, you can detect this a problem. And the fact is that it begins in uh, early childhood and it's rooted in stereotypes. stereotypes. And if you're interested in a reviewing a, a very recent review article by Dr. Rachel Roper, uh, published just last week, where she points out very clearly that while most faculty and scientists 
believe that they are fair and unbiased, numerous well studies, you know, trans studies actually show that gender, and I would add uh, race bias uh, in science and medicine is widespread and persistent. And she nicely puts it into several buckets, uh, and hiring, promotion, and grants with all of the pertinent references, bias and peer review, students and trainees, and, and I think this one is often forgotten, the whole, idea, the whole phenomena that uh, faculty of color are often downgraded and women by the students and, and, and that really threatens their careers and I've seen uh, myself careers of people destroyed because of those, um, uh, those kinds of gradients. Uh, respect salaries and very importantly those of us who are physician scientists patient care and research so I'm not able to go through it all but I want to just show you some a very little bit of the data that speaks to the fact that these stereotypes are really rooted in our minds even when we don't know them um, you all are familiar with the draw scientist experiments that were done uh, in the mid 90s and more recently and we're showing now that there is a more children will draw women as scientists but still overwhelmingly they draw a man and when I used to talk about that uh, as those studies in the early days people would point out and say well you know these are studies from the 90s things have changed well here's an experiment that was done and published just 2016 where the researchers took actual photographs from uh, uh, university websites and they asked their students to grade them for masculinity or femininity and sometimes the faces were women and sometimes they were men and then they took each individual photograph and they said to a student is this person more likely to be a teacher or a scientist? And you can imagine what the results were. When the faces were uh, women, the more feminine, the less likely for less salary. And so these studies do matter. So the question has arisen, what can we do about that? Are we just fated? Do we just accept it? And it, what we are seeing now in the literature is that raising awareness may help if done with caution and with tools to help people. Otherwise, it has can backfire. And here's a little contribution of my own to the literature when I was at Stanford, where we started to develop these um, tools. It was basically a 20 minute talk on implicit bias um, that was. Um, to be given to the faculty. And what we did at the same time was to measure pre and post implicit bias as assessed by the implicit association test. Now the question arose, who should give this talk? And this is where I purposely biased the experiment because I had realized that when I talked about these things, I would see the eyes rolling and not concentrating. <laughs> so I decided that it would be much better if the talk was given by the department chairs. So we taught at the department chairs, so they brought them in one at a time, not in big groups, and showed them the presentation and invited their input. So by the time they left the room, they felt they owned it. And we asked them then to give the presentation to their faculty uh, at their faculty meetings. And we said to them, you could actually add lib a little bit and then get into the talk and the chair of the department of surgery i would say won the prize because his ad lib was that um he told the story of the first woman who was uh, a, a, a surgical resident her name was jesse smith jesse turned up day one for her residency and um, nobody had realized that Jessie was a woman. <laughs> and so they tried to kick her out, but with a lot of work, she, she stayed and she became a fantastic resident. So he prefaced this. And I would say that it was in the Department of Surgery that we saw the greatest delta 
in the implicit bias association. So prior to, uh, suffice it to say that regardless of men or women, we saw this change in the measured implicit bias association test, and which led us to believe that we can change perceptions and reduce implicit bias. And the question has always been raised, does that make a difference to hiring? And here's some work done by Molly Carnes from the um, University of Wisconsin, where she actually did a randomized control trial uh, of uh, several departments uh, who re either received this uh, awareness raising intervention. And what you can see here, the experimental group always has a slightly increased uh, level of hiring of, of uh, women faculty um, when you look at uh, for uh, uh, non-whites and URM uh, faculty. So, so what, what we see here is some readout that these approaches might be, uh, might be helpful. Uh, these studies are not sufficiently powered and uh, Molly, I believe, is funded to do uh, an even larger study. So I mentioned that these social and psychological factors can get in the way and cause very important um, barriers for the individual. One particular barrier is the implicit, uh, is the imposter syndrome, which is a psychological pattern in which the individual doubts their accomplishment and uh, has a per persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. Um, there are ways to recognize this, the feelings of anxiety and doubting. Uh, there are four hallmarks anxiety, perfectionism, self-doubt, fear and failure, fear of failure, um, and the accomplishments, uh, uh, feeling that the accomplishment, your own accomplishment, uh, accomplishments are due to luck, timing, or other factors. Um, and they often, it's, the phenomena is often sparked when a person has new opportunities, for example, being um, invited to speak. And I will give my own anecdote of that. Uh, you may not know that the, um, the Pathfinder Award was run very similar to the uh, Pioneer Award where you were invited to give, uh, the 10 top scorers were invited to give a talk. And suddenly I found myself as the person who's had to go and stand up there and talk about a social psychological phenomenon with my background being a cardiologist. So I was in, in, in sheer stereotype threat. And I gave the talk, my practice talk at Stanford, and it was an absolute disaster. I was completely tongue-tied until I had some, some process of um, getting over my fear uh, that uh, led to a, a very good presentation in the end. So this, these phenomena are real. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and very, very important, and here's the stereotype threat phenomenon. Um, again, bringing it back to the BBC, this phenomenon is being studied, and in fact, they already have a publication uh, where uh, the, an intervention called STEP was used and with the measured outcomes of course grades, abstract reason, and resilience, and what you can see here is in each of these parameters, it feels like the intervention actually works. And this builds very nicely from some work that was done about uh, eight years ago at Yale, where um, African American students just having a belonging intervention uh, were found to be um, to improve their grades and to do extremely well just with a one hour intervention. And so uh, these are really important things to uh, think about. Um, a lot is known about stereotype threat. Um, this is, we, uh, at the Pathfinder Award, one of the publications out of that is that we develop some susceptibility measures, sense of belonging being a key one, um, and uh, what we found that these uh, might predict the attrition array and the vulnerability of women in, in, in science. Um, this is a uh, lesson from CDC. We've now learned that, uh, that uh, evaluation is critical, critically important to think about it ahead of time, and this is now permeating 
all of the work that we are doing both internally and externally. And we have the short-term measures, um, uh, such as uh, measures of science identity, uh, and then longer-term measures, uh, uh, persistence in the biomedical majors, graduation, uh, etc. And here, this is nice work that is uh, also uh, being reported, which uh, Bill is showing the uh, science identity that some of the interventions that you are all doing are impacting science identity uh, when you look at built institutions in blue and compare them to non-built institutions. So that rigorous type of evaluation is critically important. And now we are thinking about how we might use these kinds of shared metrics, um, especially metrics around institutional culture. The, uh, the good news is that there are one or two validated instruments out there. There's one called Sea Change, which has a whole number of dimensions in it. And that is what we are thinking about using in upcoming faculty diversity uh, programs. So based on all of that, and in, uh, we, uh, I regard the intramural program as an opportunity to test out some of these ideas that are coming out of DPC. Um, in particular, uh, just FYI, the uh, intramural program at NIH has 1,000 scientists um, and 3,000 postdocs, 2,000 postbacs. It's like a mini uh, NIH-funded institution. And so the things that we're testing out there is systematic, unbiased approaches to identify candidates, remembering what Kenny has taught us, that the pool exists. It's our job to go out and find them. Uh, doing trans-NIH searches for tenure track, and this again goes to a systematic, system-wide approach that any institution can take up. And then equity having a committee that's looking at these data on a regular basis so that it is not just a report that sits on the shelf, but is actually measuring gaps and hopefully tying it to reward systems. None of this uh, talk like this would be complete without the mention of sexual harassment prevention. And then, of course, the numbers matter. I talked a lot already about the social and psychological factors. Well, the behavioral scientists will teach us that the numbers actually are critically important in driving those numbers. So what can we do about this? We've started something called the Distinguished Scholars Program, which is a cohort uh, hiring program, which we believe, uh, combined with mentoring, and with that systems change, we will be able to rapidly change the uh, institutional culture. And we're having the talking about plans for NIH-funded institutions. Now, I think many of you have seen this. This is our toolkit that combines, uh, gives you tools to work on four areas, mentoring, how you find a diverse uh, um, pool of candidates, unbiased searches, and, and, and outreach. So just a, a brief word about this NIH Equity Committee. Uh, the committee is moderate size, about 20 uh, senior investigators and some other folks uh, who uh, come together on a monthly basis to look at reports from scientific directors. Scientific directors, the equivalent in your institutions, will be department chairs. And they are asked to bring and provide us with data along several metrics. And here are the, uh, I'll show you the metrics in a minute. And uh, not only do we look at those, but we, um, we actually address some really difficult issues. For example, the lack of women and URGs in leadership positions. And whether or not we can be uh, evoking other ways of uh, opportunity like term limits. And uh, with this particular type of term limits, I mean, the um, Science Magazine got word of it. We haven't fully implemented it yet, but they were intrigued. This, um, this article appeared in May. Shake up at NIH, term limits for important positions. 
would open new opportunities. Um, I was misquoted there, I think. Um, <laughs> they said that I said that um, that there are ch chiefdoms um, that needed to be changed, and that um, this whole thing is going to be applied for director and scientific director positions. I wish I'd said it, but I didn't. Don't think I had enough guts to say it. <laughs> but I just went ahead and approved it. <laughs> so here are the kinds of metrics. This is what we end in news to you: the demographic, salary, and resources. Every time you do that, you see a gap for women. So identify them and close them. Uh, these very important committees make sure that there is diversity in there and the work is done. Uh, and that they are trained to recognize and overcome uh, implicit and explicit bias. And then there's diversity in the speaker series. You all uh, heard what Dr. Collins, this announcement that he made that he was not going to uh, participate in manuals anymore. Um, and, um, and so all of that is uh, really uh, important. A word about sexual harassment, which is a major problem in science. We've learned a lot from the National Academy's consensus report, which actually points out that gender harassment, which is uh, verbal and non-verbal communications that send the message that uh, any particular group does not belong, is actually just as pernicious, just as damaging as these other forms of sexual harassment, such as sexual uh, attention and uh, coercion. And they push us to be, uh, begin to do work in this uh, space because we must realize that the insufficient attention to the climate that tolerates this gender harassment is what leads to the rest of it. So NIH has put together a whole series of anti-harassment programs which provides oversight for the problem, uh, provides a program in which the reporting can occur uh, confidentially and which uh, independent uh, review of the cases, uh, new policies, particularly the personal relationship policies that diffuses this hierarchical relationship between uh, student and, um, and their mentor, and then uh, other uh, tools and training. Um, very important as part of this was a workplace climate survey which my uh, office uh, was charged with designing and implementing. It is the most stressful thing I've ever done in my whole life. Again, uh, doing work that is not exactly in my field as a cardiologist um, <laughs> and trying to manage uh, the egos of the um, content experts in this area, I think was really quite a feat. Uh, that said, a very important finding that over 30% of our trainees have experienced some type of sexual harassment within the NIH uh, And this is just to show you an overall um, prevalence uh, of uh, people experiencing sexual harassment, uh, 20, nearly 27% of women compared to 12% of men, and uh, other gender identities, although the numbers are small, are uh, really high um, rates of experiencing uh, this, uh, um, this problem. Bisexual orientation, this really points us, this is, you know, nearly 500 people here uh, sample the higher rates of uh, experiences of sexual harassment, which points us to uh, another vulnerable group that we must be thinking about um, as we do these work for culture change within our institutions. So to implement all of this, um, we had uh, have Kyle Hashimoto, who is an experienced uh, researcher from Yale, has joined us. He has a long track record of uh, uh, working with students and graduate students uh, and mentoring, and he has joined our team in the integral program. Um, he supports the uh, success of early career intramural uh, scientists, somebody to go to to talk about issues. He looks at hiring packages advises uh, the uh, incoming faculty of what is fair and what they should uh, should be asking for. It's amazing how still women tend not to negotiate. Um, and then he is running this Distinguished Scholars Program that I uh, mentioned. 
we've learned a lot of this again from NRMA. Um, the good mentoring relationships uh, can promote diverse uh, environments um, and all of the good things about how it enhances the uh, science identity, sense of belonging, and our own uh, Chris Fund um, uh, helped us actually develop some of these tools. And then finally, I just wanted to talk about this Distinguished Scholars Program because we are super excited about this. The idea is to uh, hire a cohort of individuals who are from diverse backgrounds and bring them together and as a cohort and have them do their professional development together and their networking during the pre-tenure stage. This model has worked in many of our undergrad and grad programs and it's just never been tried for faculty level. For faculty level. And we are already seeing a turn in the curve Notice that the criteria is um, institutional by recruiting a substantial noise with demonstrated commitment to diversity and inclusion. Does that sound legal to you? <laughs> <laughs> we cannot, could not call out any group, but it turns out when you define it like that, the numbers of um, participants from the classic underrepresented groups are highly enriched. And already, our uh, representation in the tenure track has gone up to about 12% URM. Next year, it will be 18%. I've seen the data, and it will be just turning the curve uh, dramatically. And the question is, can we do that for the extramural uh, community? Can NIH actually partner with institutions to do this work? Can they actually? Can we have a, a CEC? that will collect the data and make sure that the institutions are doing what they should be doing and working towards shared metrics and just there will be much more to come. So I want to recognize the team that does all this wonderful work. You can see it's not a large team, but it's a highly efficient team. Uh, and I hope that you will agree that contrary to the usual adage that great minds think alike, I convince you that great minds think differently. Okay. Any questions? Comments? Come. I really enjoyed it. But, um, I'm not the copy here from the Detroit. Um, so my question is, and I have funded by and and we show the data that there is a relatively good amount of uh, URG PhDs in analysis of field, but the pipeline of uh, getting a faculty position is lower. So, in the, and I also study, I also go to the NIH sections, and we have a new investigator criteria. So, do you think is there any way we can put a URG on top of the on top of the new investigator criteria and having, because I know there is a correlation between having a NIH grant out of one and faculty position. So if that's possible. Yes, you, you can imagine I would love to do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think ROCG, um, but we've asked several times uh, whether we could do that. Um, it seems obvious, doesn't it? We have uh, ESI, get extra points, etc., etc. But we have not been able to successfully navigate that. I won't stop trying. Uh, thanks for So thanks for a wonderful presentation. I see that you've uh, authored the first piece on sexual harassment, which I think that's wonderful. Um, have you thought about including in the presentation the whites as racist stereotype threat and uh, white fragility? Because I think with a lot of this discussion, what happens is that our white uh, colleagues are having a hard time really um, accepting a lot of the information because of those two, the, the threat and the fragility. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I'm in the process of um, broadening this discussion uh, with um, steps. You know, uh, if you heard me talk a few months ago or last year, it was 
uh, almost uh, all focused on implicit bias. I think we should be talking about this in bias in, uh, as in its full range, including causal relationship of bias, the, the two that you, you mentioned, absolutely. Any other questions? Let's give Dr. Valentine another round of applause.